Good morning, and the Lord be with you. We have a full service for you this morning here on the third Sunday of Lent. Um, I want to wish Sione Malua a happy birthday today. Um, you will hear from him in just a moment. And there is a drive-by parade which will surprise him, I hope, at 1 o'clock today. So if you want to join us, let me know. All right. Um, let us begin with our affirmation of faith. I am a beloved child of God and a beauty to behold. Have a good Sunday. Thank you. Hello, when go ahead. My name is Sione. I'm going to introduce to you myself again. It's a long time. It is a long time to see you folks. And I still miss you. And you are in my prayer every day. It's a long time. I don't know how long the pandemic go, but this is a long time I come to church too. Today I come to church. I just walk in to the sanctuary and I feel the presence of God is in here. It's still in here. Maybe we have a chance we will just walk in to our church to see our God is still here with us and still with us every day. This time the Tongan Fellowship is, is okay. We still not lost anyone to the, to the pandemic. We still sick but we still not lost. We still praying to each other and we still take care of each other. What we do right now, 
And I think this is most important to us. To coming to be really focused, to take care and looking for each other. What to make us benefit all from the grace of God is with us, spiritually and physically. I love you all and have a happy, happy late new year. Thank you very much from Sion and Marua. Good morning. I have a few calendar reminders for you this week before we get started with this morning's service. The first is confirmation class, a reminder that you will be meeting this afternoon at 3 o'clock. Ad board, you have a meeting Thursday evening at 6.30. And Circle of Hope, you'll be meeting next Saturday at 1 o'clock. Again, all of those meetings will be on Zoom, so be sure to reach out if you need an invite link. Another reminder that next week is daylight savings, so be sure to move your clocks forward before you go to bed on Saturday evening, otherwise you might be late for church. The good news is if you are late and you oversleep, you won't miss church, you can just watch it later. All right, for announcements this week, um, a last call for the Wednesday book study. The book is called Cast by Isabel Wilkerson, and Deb Avery will be leading that discussion, so be sure to reach out to Deb if you would like to participate. The last announcement comes from our education team who has been putting together virtual Sunday school videos. They are planning ahead for Easter Sunday and have asked that we submit our Easter photos, photos of past Easter celebrations. It can be from last year or years prior, um, photos from church or from home. Regardless, they would like to put together a compilation of Easter photos and celebrations um, to use in their virtual Sunday school video on Easter Sunday. So the deadline to submit those is March 31st, and you can submit them to the church office by emailing vancouverheightsumc at gmail.com. Okay, that's all I have for announcements this week. We do have a few birthdays that we'd like to recognize. Today is Pastor Sione and Wynette Sailor's birthday. Um, Tuesday is Miss Debbie, or Deb Avery's birthday, as well as David Haas's. And then on Thursday is Jonathan Caldwell's birthday. So we'd like to wish all of you a happy birthday. And for everyone else, I hope that you stay safe, continue to stay in touch, and have a great week. again to read another story about Jesus. And today our story is called Trouble in the Temple, and it's from Matthew 21, Mark 11, and Luke 19. <clears throat> the first thing Jesus did in Jerusalem was to visit his father's temple. He was appalled to find that all the greedy cheating people that he had thrown out before were back again, trying to make money off the poor people who came to make sacrifices to God. He looked around in anger, shouting, No! God said that this temple was to be a place where people from all nations could come to pray to him, but you have made it a den of robbers! With these words, he tore through the temple, throwing everyone out who shouldn't be there. When he had finished, uh, the temple was once again calm and tranquil. The poor people, the beggars, and the sick began to find their way back in and came to Jesus to be healed and to feel better. Children danced for joy around him and everyone was happy, apart from the Pharisees, who plotted to get rid of him. Whoa! Jesus was angry in this story. Can you think of a time you were angry or frustrated? 
every year Mary and Joseph would take Jesus to visit the temple in Jerusalem. The temple is an important place to Jesus, the Son of God, because it is where he could go to pray and worship God. But this time, when Jesus went to the temple, things were a little different. There were people there with tables set up to sell animals and other things. The people selling things were not being fair and cheating the poor people who were trying to buy things. The temple was filled with tables and animals. Imagine a market with people talking and birds chirping, coins clinking, and lots of other sounds and movement. When Jesus saw this, he was angry. He saw that people were getting cheated. And he saw all the tables around the temple and he shouted, no, God said this temple is a place where all people can come and pray. Then he went through the temple, kicking everyone who was selling things out. Once everyone was out, the temple was calm and peaceful and people started to go back to the temple to be with Jesus and God. Everyone was happy. Jesus knew what was going on. People were being cheated in the temple, in God's house. Jesus was angry people were being cheated. In a similar way, you might be angry when someone you love is hurt by others. Jesus felt angry the people that he loved very much were being cheated and treated unfair right in God's house. Love is gentle and kind, but love can also be angry at things that are not right or unjust. We can follow Jesus' example by being fair and nice to others and by protecting the people who need it. God gives us the strength and courage to show love and justice in our world. Please join me in an attitude of prayer. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen.
Today's scripture reading comes from John chapter 2, verses 13 through 22. The Passover of the Jews was near, and Jesus went up to Jerusalem. In the temple, he found people selling cattle, sheep, and doves, and the money changers seated at their tables. Making a whip of cords, he drove all of them out of the temple, both the sheep and the cattle. He also poured out the coins of the money changers and overturned their tables. He told those who were selling the doves, take these things out of here. Stop making my father's house a marketplace. His disciples remembered that it was written, zeal for your house will consume me. The Jews then said to him, what sign can you show us for doing this? Jesus answered them, destroy this temple and in three days I will raise it up. The Jews then said, this temple has been under construction for 46 years and you will raise it up in three days? But he was speaking of the temple of his body. After he was raised from the dead, his disciples remembered that he had said this, and they believed the scripture and the word that Jesus had spoken. And this ends today's scripture reading. This morning we have two very different stories of Jesus in the temple. We have one story as was shared by Abby during our children's time. It's primarily the story of Matthew, Mark, and Luke. Um, it's the story of the end of Jesus' life and ministry. Um, he has triumphantly entered the city of Jerusalem. People have waved their palms. And then he goes quickly into the temple to assert his authority. And images that you might find would include Jesus wearing red because he's upset, and you should know that. Um, and he often has whips in his hands, he's turning over the table, and there's chaos. And the truth be told, there was chaos before he entered the temple, which is why he is so upset. Um, the reality is that the, the system of sacrifice um, the, the means of atonement in the day in the temple had become so out of control that the Gentiles were literally blocked from getting into their place of worship. And so there's a statement that is made by Jesus during Holy Week, and it is said that this is what really truly upset the religious authorities. Um, they could not have this of Jesus. We have some incidents in the news of, of opportunities where the tables get overturned. Um, that has often been the metaphor I've used at, in my 20 plus years of ministry as the church has, has battled with itself, the United Methodist Church, um, over issues of homosexuality and LGBTQIA leadership rights privileges. Um, and as I've watched um, and heard reports of people going through the trash of my colleagues looking for evidence of something, um, as I've been a part of church trials, as I've watched annual conferences um, be nothing but battlegrounds, as I've watched um, disheartened people leave our church, I will say I am pleased by news that we have... Um, dealt with our irreconcilable differences with a split. Um, that there will be now a global Methodist church that has taken, that will take flight and will take some of those folks who are unhappy with our inclusion. And I wish them well. And I ho will hope that they will follow through with their promise to love God and love God's people and that they will take the money that the United Methodist Church has offered them to do the racial work that we all need to do. Now, let's go back to the Gospel of John. It's a, a little bit more intense, actually, um, because in the Gospel of John, this is not the last thing Jesus does. This is the f well, one of the first things he does in his ministry. So we are only in chapter 2 in John, which is why I wanted Stephanie to read um, the full um, gospel story to you. Jesus has been um, inched by his mom into ministry, or maybe pushed, um, at the wedding of Cana. 
um, to bless the ceremony by turning the water into wine. And so now here he is um, walking um, into the temple, sort of like the bridegroom, um, and announcing himself and um, acknowledging that within him, in him, is the embodiment of God. That actually the temple is not necessarily obsolete, but that the people that are running the temple do not have um, soul grasp of God's presence. Perhaps they never did, but for sure he wants to make sure um, that his presence is known. And we have stories that will follow that, that will really underline and highlight that point. And so quickly he will go to the Samaritan woman at the well, one of my favorite stories, and he, she will say, now, we worship on this mountain and the Judeans worship on this mountain, which is it? And Jesus um, doesn't want to talk about mountains or places of worship. And by the end of the story, she is gathering the people of her town and they are worshiping Jesus. They are worshiping his presence. They are worshiping his good news. And this will continue throughout the Gospel of John. It continues when Jesus heals the blind man and the blind man kneels before him and, and praises him as God. Um, he worships God um, in the sight of Jesus. Holy moly, this is actually a little more intense than overturning a table or two. This is, um, in, the, in the words of Caroline Lewis, this is um, God has left the temple and God is loose in the world. God is made real for us in the body of Christ that, that lived among God's people all those years ago that lives among us today, that lives through us today. And so the, the challenge then for um, John was to continue to increase this expectation so that there wasn't squabbling that happened in the last week of Jesus' life. There was um, an overcoming of death. And so Holy Week in John starts with Lazarus being raised from the dead. And oh my goodness, uh, who wants to talk about that? Who wants to allow evidence of that um, to be around us? Because who is going to want to um, fight over doves, turtle doves, and grains, and 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 sacrificial animals on the altar and making this big crazy mess when we've got that going on out there. When we've got that going on out there. We've got a lot that continues to go on out here um, in our world, in our lives, and thankfully God is continuing to work to bring life from places of death. That God is continuing to call us um, to to challenge um, authority or commonality is perhaps it may be. We started a year ago um, through the Black Lives Matter movement of having on our reader board names of people, um, say their names, we said. And, and this week we have two names that the Justice Committee would like me to say. Um, one name is Dustin Hawkins. Do you know about Dustin Hawkins? He was a, a young man who went to Jiffy Lube to have his car repaired, his oil changed perhaps, most likely. Um, and as he left, he found out that the customer name that was written on his receipt was George Floyd. And so how might we take that? I don't know, but it doesn't sound very good. Um, it doesn't sound very good to know that that happened in Vancouver in the last few weeks. The other name we lift up is Breon Smith. And she is the woman who was getting off the highway. She was stopped at a red light um, after a car had, had challenged her a bit on, I think, 205. She had stopped down by Chaklov, where, you know, Trader Joe's is, and someone came up from behind her with a sledgehammer, broke her, the glass on her car, um, and 
threatened to endanger the life of her and her small child in the back seat. What, what is that about in Vancouver? Is that um, something we will allow to be there? Is that what we see as just the way things are? Or will we finally um, raise our voices and bring back from the dead um, the promise of God that all our beloved children and all are meant to be safe and well as embodiments of Jesus Christ in this world. That is really all I've got for you this week. We have many other people that are sharing our messages. Um, I wanna wish you a healthy week. I hope you're getting your vaccinations scheduled or done. If not, please let us know. Um, we're helping as we can. And we are looking forward to a time when we will gather um, at least 20 at a time um, to be able to be a blessing to one another. Speak. Amen. May God bless you and keep you. May God make God's face to shine upon you and be gracious unto you. May the Lord lift his countenance upon you and give you peace. In the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. Amen. In the name of the Creator and the Redeemer and the sustainer. Blessings.
Hi. It's been a long time since I've talked to you all, but uh, I've had a couple of weeks to think about uh, loss of community. In fact, I've had about a year to think about that. Um, although the last couple of weeks, I've thought a little bit more about it. And uh, one thing I've realized uh, is that loss of, uh, that community changes over your lifetime. That um, when you're young, your community is your family and your school. When you're a little older, it's your school and your family or your work. Um, and then with me, it was my business and church and different things like that. And I had uh, gotten a new counselor this year, and I told her I'd been searching for 35 years for the answer to a question I had. I wanted to know what in my childhood was preventing me to keep from, from get for not allowing me to get where I wanted to in life. And uh, throughout that process, I started realizing I had uh, actually uh, cut off a really good friendship right before the quarantine. And then the church closed down. And then my computer lab co closed down. And my all of my community support was gone. I felt uh, I couldn't get any help with my computer or my phone. I felt isolated and abandoned. I grew into a great depression and really internalized and thought about my life. And I came to the conclusion that I had been entirely too accommodating in my life, that I had always set aside my own um, needs and wants and desires for others to help others. I was always either helping my mother, protecting my sister, taking care of my brother, uh, taking care of friends, always helping other people and solving their problems, but never uh, doing things f for the betterment of my own life. So I started prioritizing my own life, and I began to uh, realize how um, how my place had become a shambles, that I'd been so busy doing other things for other people and other organizations that my whole surroundings had become a shambles. And I started being propelled uh, to clean and organize, and I started realizing that it was God propelling me. And I was getting ready for something, but I didn't know what, and, but I just kept doing it. And uh, towards the middle of the process, I started realizing um, that I had other forms of community. My neighborhood, people in my neighborhood I had not gotten to know. And I started getting to know a lady, a Jewish lady down the street, and I started helping her, taking her on errands, and we became really good friends. And, we even went out for donuts once when they first started opening up. And uh, she moved to Florida in October, so I lost that f community, although I still keep in touch with her by email. And then I had some new neighbors who, who I got to know, but more importantly, they started doing little acts of kindness for me. They were mowing my lawn and helping me with things that were too heavy. and. Um, and the Jewish lady before she moved would send up handmade pretzels and I started doing little acts of kindness. And through all this, this I just kept being propelled to move forward. And in the middle of the process I realized that it had something to do with housing. And I'd been on housing lists for about four years. And I had always been told I would um, be in three to 500 square feet. And so that's what I was preparing for. And uh, as time went on, I started realizing that something else was gelling, that I might be moving into something that I had only dreamed of. And I had made a vision board about three years ago with housing on it. And um, it's been on, on my closet for years. And uh, finally, uh, one of my church community members 
asked me if I wanted to move into a mobile home with her. And it was a double wide three bedroom mobile home with just more space than I could possibly imagine. I, just what I had dreamed of. And I was so uncertain about my dream coming true that almost until the very last minute, I kept saying, if, if it will happen, or if I move, or if this. Um, and anyway, uh, I started realizing, then I, I got another whole community around me of social workers that were helping me with my move and with packing and all this kind of stuff. And I finally got moved into my dream home. <laughs> and um, I have a good roommate. I have my own room with my own bathroom. I, I, it's just everything I've ever dreamed of. It's just so much bigger than I was planning. And I even can do my yard work. And I started realizing that dreams could tr come true. And uh, a dream is coming true for us now with the vaccine and that we're all going to be together again. And I'll bet you that uh, everybody's waiting for the first potluck. <laughs> and I don't think Monty and Karen are gonna mind picking up that fried chick, greasy fried chicken for us either. I think they're just gonna be so happy we can get together. And so I'm really looking forward to the day that we can have our potlucks and our fellowships and our, our coffee hour and reunite our, com our community and our fellowship. And I realized too how much my, my community meant to me and how much people in the congregation meant to me and the things I missed about them and um, the things I missed about church. And um, I just, I feel that I couldn't have made this move psychologically or emotionally. I would never have been prepared if it hadn't been for the quarantine. And so I hope many of you have grown a lot during the quarantine and have learned about the good things about it and that we can all move forward as we get vaccinated and ha be a better, have a better life and a better world. Thank you.